When you arrive to Saint-Germain-en-Laye, you need to take a bus. There are two buses. There is a bus 259 and there is a bus number 10. It's literally like five minutes ride on the bus, no? Yeah. yeah, it's very close by. You stop at the stop called Les Lampes and um, yeah, and then you walk. There are signages on the street. It's really pretty here. Yeah. It's really, really nice. Today we take you to a chateau that is not usually on the itinerary of an average Paris visitor, but it definitely should be. We take you to Chateau de Monte Cristo, the home of Alexandre Dumas. Back in 1844, Alexandre Dumas was extremely popular, basking in success and glory following the releases of The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo. It was his lifelong dream to build a home surrounded by beautiful land, and on one of his walks from Saint-Germain-en-Laye, this is precisely what the author found. He was on a walk from Saint-Germain, which is nearby, by the way, if you haven't seen Saint-Germain Chateau, you can check our episode up here. And, um, he fell in love with this area. This used to be just the forest and the hill and gorgeous views on this, over the Seine and the surrounding areas. And he decided that he wanted to build a chateau in here. Now, by traditional understanding of what chateau is, you normally expect a huge castle. Well, this is not really the case. This is a smaller building that is beautiful nonetheless. And um, it costs a lot of money. He used to say that I love those who love me. You can imagine how many friends he had. This is the first time Dumas was able to make a purchase of this size. So naturally, his ideas and plans had to match its proportions. In search of tranquility, to find inspiration and creativity, Alexandre Dumas said, I want a Renaissance castle opposite a Gothic pavilion surrounded by water and an English-style park embellished with caves, rockeries and waterfalls. The result of his desires is what can be seen today, a magnificent neo-Renaissance chateau that lays on a picturesque hill surrounded by a beautiful English-style garden, caves, waterfalls and a neo-Gothic pavilion. The property used to include horse stables, but they have since then been sold to a private owner. As desired as he was, Alexandre Dumas did not enjoy his newfound haven for long. His excess living and the French Revolution of 1848 led him to ruin. He was eventually forced to sell Monte Cristo with all of its furniture, though he could still enjoy it until 1851, before going into exile in Belgium. When visiting the chateau, one can almost feel the personal involvement and extravagant taste of Dumas in its creation. The imagination runs high and the architectural movements of the time are completely ignored. Even though the property is surrounded by everything modern you could possibly have, a highway, residential blocks, even a hospital, None of that is permitted to penetrate into the world of Dumas. You feel as if frozen in time and only get back to the hustle and bustle of today once you've left. Le Salon Moresque. This is the most beautiful and fascinating room in the chateau. It feels out of place and yet organic, perhaps to reflect Dumas' character and his passion for travel and exploration. The Orient takes up residence in this living room. It was during one of his trips to Tunisia that Dumas, captivated by the local art, obtained a permit to bring an artist and his son to France so they could create this oriental capsule in his home. This is the centerpiece of the chateau. Sinan doesn't really like it, but I absolutely love it. And one notable thing about that room is that it was restored with the help of the King of Morocco, Hassan II, I think. Yeah. And uh, it was restored in the, again, I think it was in 1970s, no, 1985. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. You can see like the work with the stone is, it's like you're looking at the embroidery. Craftsmanship is just incredible. This is Chateau Diff where Alexandre Dumas used to come to isolate himself from outside world just to be in a quieter environment so he can be inspired to write his novels. As you can see, there are so many names of his work on the facade of the building. The chateau passed through different private owners until 1969, where the real estate company who owned it at the time planned to destroy it to give way to 400 housing unions. Imagine. Thanks to the three communities or cities, Port Marly, Marly-le-Roi, 
and Le Pec, and the Society of Friends of Alexandre Dumas, the chateau was saved and due to the great many efforts, was eventually classified as a monument historique or historic monument in 2016. One more thing I wanted to add is that we've been planning to come here for a long time, but I really wanted to come here when it's green and lush yeah. to give you guys an idea of how beautiful this place is and perhaps try and understand why Alexandre Dumas fell in love with this place. It's gorgeous here. Very inspiring. It's very inspiring. Yeah. I love it here. Yes. It's so inspiring it's and it's so inspiring. romantic and it's so yeah. poetic. It's yeah. gorgeous. And I also realized that uh, in both chateaus, he put so many windows. Mm. I believe he just is trying to make it as light as possible just to get inspired. But yeah. it's just magnificent. Actually. It's gorgeous, yes. Yeah. Highly recommended. This chateau is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. If you liked this episode, I'm sure you will be liking this one as well. Until next week, au revoir.